Hi, this is Stacy Chilemi from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with us today. This is Dr. Brad, and he is here to share some amazing words of wisdom with us. And I'm just going to let it just hand the pan right over to him and just let him tell you a little about himself and all the wonderful things he does. So, Dr. Brad, you want you to take it away and tell people a little about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Stacy. Well, um, I've been a holistic physician now for about 35 years, and um, I left my practice in 2004 to write a book um, that uh, came out in 2007 called The Emotion Code. And uh, what The Emotion Code is about is uh, emotional baggage, really. And what I found during the years that I was in practice was that uh, all of my patients, no matter how young or old they were, no matter... Uh, what they were suffering from, whether it was uh, some kind of a physical condition or a mental emotional condition, they were dealing with depression or anxiety or phobias or panic attacks or PTSD or an eating disorder or some kind of self-sabotage, or if they were dealing with uh, uh, some kind of physical pain like migraine headaches or neck pain or back pain or knee pain, or if they were dealing with uh, more complicated things like uh, infertility or asthma or digestive disorders, or if they'd been diagnosed with some kind of a disease process, what I found was all of these situations, all these people with all their varied symptoms, all had something in common that was causing their symptoms, uh, at, sometimes in whole, uh, but often in part. And that was what I came to call their emotional baggage. And um, so it was such a game-changing thing. Uh, and I had developed uh, such a simple way of finding and removing emotional baggage that I knew that the, the world needed to know about this. So I left my practice in 2004, published the Emotion Code book. And since then, it's gone out uh, uh, to many languages all over the world. And um, so let me explain what this is about. Because, you know, um, we use that phrase, emotional baggage, right? usually when we're referring to someone else. Yes. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is we all have emotional baggage, but we now know what emotional baggage is. You see, the body itself is an energy field. I mean, if you talk to any quantum physicist, they'll tell you, well, yes, if you get down to the level of the atom and beyond, um, when you get down to the quantum level, the smallest particles and energies that make up uh, the atom, uh, then you realize that that's really what we're made of. I mean, if you zoom in on your hand with a big enough microscope uh, and you could keep zooming in at a, about a million times magnification or more, you'd be looking at a single individual atom and you'd notice that the next atom is a long distance away. And um, that if, if you looked inside the atom, you'd see there's really nothing in there, just little energies that are zipping around at the speed of light. And that's really what we are. So when you're feeling a particular emotion, on a quantum level, what's happening is that you're feeling a certain vibration. There's a certain frequency. See, every emotion, well, first of all, everything is energy. Thoughts are yeah. energy, right? Um, the whole world, our bodies, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything ultimately is energy. And yes. emotions are energy too. So if you're feeling a really powerful emotion, uh, you're feeling a certain frequency, a certain vibration. And if the emotion is anger, that's a different frequency than if the emotion is grief and so on. Well, sometimes those emotions that we go through, that we feel are so powerful that they don't get processed very well. And so the energy of that emotion becomes trapped in the body. And literally we refer to these as trapped emotions. Yeah. And what I found was that um, these trapped emotions are causing all kinds of issues for us. I remember one of the first people that I saw that had a trapped emotion uh, was a woman that came in to see me that I had seen before, but it had been a, a few months. One day she comes in and she says, she thinks she's having a heart attack and she's got chest pain. She's got difficulty breathing. Um, the left side of her face is totally numb. Her left arm is totally numb. I mean, looks like a heart attack. And our office was very close to a medical center. So I told mm -hmm. my staff, look, we might need an ambulance, but let me take one minute with her. And so I asked some questions um, and 
got some answers from her subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is where all the answers are. And we have a very concrete way of asking questions and getting answers from it. Uh, because consciously, we don't really know very much. But the subconscious mind remembers everything that's ever happened to us. Yes. And uh, it knows everything. And so uh, within less than a minute, I found out that um, there was an emotion that was trapped in her body that was creating the symptoms for her. And the emotion was grief. And uh, her subconscious mind indicated that we needed to know a little more about this. So I asked a few more questions and found out that this had occurred when, um, well, three years before. And when I arrived at that, she burst into tears. And she said, I can't believe that's affecting me. I thought I dealt with all that. And I said, well, what in the world happened? And she said that three years before her husband had been having an affair. She didn't know about it. But about three years before she started putting the pieces together and confronted him with the evidence and the whole marriage blew up. And she was really deeply in love with that guy, her yeah. husband, and was planning on being with him forever. But now all of a sudden she'd been betrayed and they ended up getting divorced. And she spent about a year in therapy dealing with it. And, and she'd actually even gotten remarried. So as far as she was concerned, that guy was just her ex and it was all over. But as far as her body was concerned, yeah, she was still holding that grief. And so to release an emotion like that, it's a very simple, easy process. It just takes a few seconds, really, once the emotion's been identified. And so mm -hmm. I just swiped down at her back a few times to release the energy. And within about three seconds, the feeling came back into her arm, into her face, chest pain really? was gone, difficulty breathing was gone. Yeah. And um, I'm still, she's never had any other trouble, but, uh, and that was a long, long time ago, um, probably, I don't even know, maybe like 34 years ago. She and I are still in touch. She has a horse ranch in Oregon. She's never had any other trouble, but I really think that um, here's a case where uh, I think if we had not found, if we had not identified that emotional energy that was yeah. trapped from her divorce, I don't think she'd still be alive. I think she would have died of uh, of a heart attack at some point, and no one would have realized that what really killed her was her husband's affair, right? Right. And so that's kind of how thought. this works. Now, is this like a form of Reiki? Does it sound a little no, bit? No, it's really not at all. Um, Reiki's great, but th this method is very different from that. It's... Uh, uh, what we're doing is we're identifying the emotional energies that are trapped in the body. And so right. the way that it works is um, we have uh, in the book, we outline a really specific protocol that you use mm -hmm. and we teach you how to do muscle testing, which is the simplest way to get answers from the subconscious mind. So oh, really? uh, yeah, in the, in the emotion code book, we teach people how to use muscle testing to get answers on other people. Uh, we teach people how to do self-testing so they can get answers on their own body. And um, yeah, and so we're teaching people all over the world uh, how to tap into their own internal computer. See, I was a computer programmer, Stacy, before I became a doctor. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I became a computer programmer starting in 1980. And, which, you know, I'm getting really old now. But anyway, uh, so I had a business called The Computer Tutor. And what I would do... Back in those days, there was no software. Uh, people would buy a new IBM PC, for example, back then, and they'd bring it into their business, but they didn't know what to do with it. So I would go in and I would look at the flow and look at everything. And then I would write the software that they could use uh, to get their computer to actually be useful, right? So um, so going into, uh, going into the healing arts was really a dream of mine because I had... I had had kidney disease um, oh, wow. that was very serious when I was uh, about 13 years old. And there was nothing, I had been diagnosed medically, but my parents were told there was really nothing they could do for me. I was either going to get well or not. And right. so my mother was very into alternative healing. Yes. And uh, she was a health, considered a health nut back in the days when if you- oh, it was, items, yeah people thought you actually were kind of out of your mind. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, she and my father took me to some people who were uh, 
some old time holistic doctors and they started working with me and I knew right away that what they were doing was exactly what my body needed. And within a few weeks, uh, these horrific pains were completely gone and they started receding immediately when they started working with me and my folks took me back to the hospital and they ran all the tests on me. And as I recall, they ran the tests twice and they said, well, it's a spontaneous remission. You know, whatever we did must have helped, but see, they hadn't done anything. And I knew it, I was only 13, but I decided, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Right. What these, what these holistic doctors were doing. And so, um, Going into, uh, go, then I've kind of got derailed in my career, but not really. But I, I deviated for a while and became a computer programmer. But then it was really an answer to prayer, uh, a really powerful answer to prayer, actually, that brought me back into uh, the healing arts. I went to chiropractic school. And mm -hmm. when I got into practice, I thought, okay, well, you know, God, higher power has gotten me into this. And I, I need help. Maybe, maybe God will help me. And so, so I developed this habit and the habit was that uh, when I would go to work on a patient, uh, I would always take just a moment. I have a momentary pause yeah. and just in my mind, I would ask for help. And, uh, and so that went on and no one ever knew I was praying for them. It was just a, it was just a way for me to acknowledge that I needed help. And I, believe that I was kind of opening, you know, a conduit to the higher power. Yeah. And, you know, we all believe different things, but I'll tell you something during all those years that I was in practice and I practiced for about, I don't know, about 18 odd years, give or take. Uh, there were times during those years when a patient would come in to see me and I didn't know how to help them, didn't know how to approach their problem. And I would ask for help. And there were times when the information that I needed would just flood in like an avalanche of understanding. Yeah. And sometimes it was a totally different way of looking at things and what I or anybody else had maybe ever thought of before. It was really amazing. And so, um, but those kinds of answers um, were few and far between. I mean, I can count those experiences on one hand. Yeah. But um, anyway, so, uh, so I wrote this book, The Emotion Code. And um, it is, uh, it's changing people's lives all over the world because they realize that, um, emotional baggage is creating all kinds of physical and mental and emotional problems for people. Oh, and yeah. there are some fascinating aspects uh, of the emotion code that we've discovered over the years. One of those, for example, is that um, we all receive emotional energy, emotional baggage from parents when we're yeah. conceived Mm -hmm. And you can find with the emotion code, you can identify those emotions that are trapped in your body and you can get rid of those. And so yeah. it's fascinating because I have seen people, for example, who, uh, who just couldn't seem to find love. And sometimes we'd find that, uh, you know, there was an ancestor who had maybe been jilted at the altar or something, or uh, we, we would sometimes find people who had a really hard time making money because maybe uh, maybe their great, great grandfather was thrown into the poor house or, you know, and so those energies pass down to us. But um, what we find is that 90% of all the physical pain that people have is actually due to emotional baggage. Now think of that. Think of all yeah. the pain clinics uh, all over the country and probably yeah, all over yeah. the world. And then think about, you know, how emotional baggage is, is such a huge cause. Um, mm -hmm. I remember um, a man that came in to see me once uh, when I was in practice that had uh, really severe low back pain. It was about a nine, between nine and 10 on a zero yeah. to 10 scale of pain. And uh, it had been going on for a number of weeks and he was miserable. And his next step was to have surgery. And so I tested him using the emotion code, getting some answers from his subconscious mind and found, uh, by the way, in the emotion code, we use a chart that looks like this. It has uh, 60 emotions on it and it's divided up into two columns and six rows. And yeah. the subconscious mind, uh, for example, in his case, I just started uh, muscle testing him. So in other mm -hmm. words, if you can imagine he's holding out his arm and I'm 
asking questions and then pressing down on his arm. And the subconscious mind is a computer, a binary computer, and it will respond yeah. with a strong muscle for yes and a weak muscle for no. And uh, what I found with him was that uh, his emotion, there was an emotion that was uh, contributing to his back pain. And it was in column A, row four, and the emotion was anger. And uh, his subconscious mind needed, to, needed us to dig a little deeper. And so I found out that it had occurred 20 years before. And immediately he said, oh yeah, he said, I know what that's about. And he explained to me that uh, he was working at this business and he had been wrongfully accused of something and um, something really serious. And he did not, he was not guilty at all in any way. And so at first he was shocked, but then it just kind of turned into this really deep seething anger that this could happen. Yeah. And so that emotion was so powerful that, that that energy became trapped in his body. So that emotional experience wasn't really over. It was kind of suspended. And that's really yeah. what this is like. It's like we go through an emotional experience and some usually we can close the loop on every one of those experiences. Right. But then sometimes we have experiences that are so big that the experience isn't over. And that's what happened with him. So anyway, uh, I took a magnet, swiped it right down the middle of his back, down the governing meridian, which is how we release a trapped emotion. Kind of like yeah. taking a credit card and rubbing a magnet on the magnetic strip. It rearranges yeah. that data. Uh, right. Three times down the middle of his back. And uh, the pain was instantaneously completely gone. And this is the kind of thing wow. that we see all the time. So this guy mm -hmm. is bending over and he's twisting this way and that way. He can't believe it. it's like, where did it go? He was just astounded. And so I want you to understand how this works. You see, when you have a trapped emotion, like this guy, mm -hmm. say 20 years before, yes. he's really angry. He develops this trapped emotion. It's like a ball of pure emotional energy. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. About the size of a baseball, the size of a softball. So this was lodged right there in his low back. Now, what, what was going on all those years was that that emotional energy was was kind of twisting and distorting the energy field of his body in that area. Now the you know the body itself is nothing more really than just a very complex energy field. And so yeah. by having that distorting force there in his low back, eventually it brought him to a point where he came to see me because he's absolutely desperate. He's in so much pain. And so, when I found that energy and released it, suddenly that distorting force was gone. His tissues can breathe again and the pain is gone. Now, and that's one part of the story, right? right. Um, trapped emotions, when you release them, it's not unusual at all for that kind of thing to happen, for pain to reduce or just completely disappear. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is the other aspect uh, of what happened. So, about three days later, he came back in for a follow-up visit. And I'll never forget this. He said to me, Dr. Nelson, he said, my back is still completely pain-free. He said, I, I still can't believe it. It's really miraculous. But he said, I need to talk to you because he said, when I came in here, I had another problem that I didn't tell you about. He said, for as long as I can remember, uh, I've basically been what you'd call a rageaholic. He said, mm -hmm. I'm always yelling at my wife and my kids. And he said, I'm just wired really tight. I've got to watch the road rage. I've been to anger management several times. It hasn't really helped me. Mm -hmm. And he said, but from the moment you release that trapped emotion of anger for me, he said, I have felt really different. I feel kind of relaxed. Things that used to just set me off don't set me off anymore. And I feel really different. He said, how did you do that? How does that work? And at the time, I really didn't know. And I told him, I said, well, I'm not really sure how that worked, but I'm glad it worked, right? But yeah. think about it this way, Stacy. This guy had a trapped emotion, a ball of anger in his low back, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So when a situation would come along in his life where he might tend to feel the emotion of anger, he would feel that emotion. And he'd slide into that resonance, that energy, that vibration of emotion much more easily than he otherwise would have. Why? Because part of his body was feeling that emotion in a sense, that frequency 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And so, so when we release these, uh, it has not only a beneficial physical effect, but it also has this beneficial emotional mental effect. Um, mm -hmm. 
I remember another, uh, another story that's a great example of this a woman had come in to see me for fibromyalgia and mm -hmm. I was working on that. And we came up, uh, as I was working with her, uh, her body indicated she had a trapped emotion. The trapped emotion was resentment. And, uh, and it went back to when she was 18 years old and she was in her mid forties at the time. It went back to 18 years old and she said, okay, I know what that's about. And I said, really? Sometimes people do know what it's about. Sometimes they don't. But right. uh, she said, she said, yeah, I know what it's about. It's this, it's about this cheerleader from high school. She said, anytime I think of that girl, I can feel the resentment welling up inside of me. She said, I don't even remember why I resented her so much back then. It's been so many years now, but yeah. it's weird. Cause it's like, I can't let that go. And I haven't seen her since then. And so we released the trapped emotion of resentment from her. Right. And uh, a couple of days later, she came back in and she said, you know, she said, that really works. Last night, I was with my friend from high school and we were talking about old times and that cheerleader's name came up. And for the first time in all these years, I felt nothing, right? Wow. And so what the emotion code does is it removes the charge you see from these, mm -hmm. uh, these emotional energies and from these experiences that we've had. So uh, the most important part of the emotion code really has to do with the heart. And um, we have to go back really to the 1960s to understand this. What happened was when they started doing heart transplants back in the 60s, it didn't take long before they noticed something strange. Sometimes some patients would come back to the hospital, back to the doctor, and they would say strange things. They would say how their taste in food or sports or music would have completely changed um, in some cases. Yeah. For example, uh, gee, you know, I never cared for classical music. Now I can't get enough of it. Uh, now, you know, I never really cared for baseball. Now I go to every game. Can you explain to me why that is? Uh, yeah. Sometimes people would have memories of being in places they had never in their life ever visited. And um, in fact, uh, the amazing thing is when these people were connected with the family of the heart donor, mm -hmm. what they would find is that there were these correlations every time. Well, yes, uh, you know, our daughter loved Rome. It was her favorite city and she's been there many times. And you say now that you have memories of being in Rome but you never in your whole life have ever visited there. Those must be her memories. How bizarre, right? How crazy right. is that? It and is. so we call, yeah, it's, we call it cellular memory. And uh, there are books written about this, you know, it's amazing. But uh, in, in fact, when I was writing the emotion code, um, there was a, a story that made national news. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about this guy who was 58 years old. He had gotten a heart transplant. And mm -hmm. uh, the heart that he received was from a, was from a young guy, early 30s, who had died uh, in a motorcycle crash. Mm -hmm. And when he got out of the hospital, he, he was so grateful to have this new lease on life uh, that he found out a little bit more information uh, about the heart that was beating in his chest now. And, yeah. uh, and he actually wrote a letter to uh, this man's widow, the heart donor's widow. And she's about half his age. And so they, she wrote him back. And so for two years, they carried on this correspondence back and forth. And then finally, they met in person. And he, and he said, the moment I saw her, I could not take my eyes off of her. It was like I had known her all my life. And they ended up getting married. Wow. There was this huge age difference, right? And it never mm -hmm. would have made the news, except for the fact that after about eight years of marriage, uh, he ended up taking his life, he shot oh, himself wow. in the head. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? That's what happened to the donor. It wasn't a motorcycle accident. He shot himself, killed himself. And then <gasps> this guy shot himself too. That's the story. I goofed it up. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that made national news as just like, wow, it's human interest story really bizarre right yeah um there's Did a you story in the widow <laughs> oh my gosh yeah <laughs> terrible 
terrible yeah. for her. But, um, you know, another famous story is where this nine-year-old girl suffering from heart failure receives the heart of another girl who actually was murdered, but they were able to get her heart and put it into this, uh, this girl that needed it. Well, once she gets out of the hospital, she starts having these nightmares. And the nightmare is the same nightmare every time. She dreams that she's being murdered. And her parents eventually, because this is so consistent and so extreme, uh, they take her to the police. And an artist is able to, from her descriptions, is able to come up with a description of the murderer. I mean, it's very clear to her what he was wearing, everything, the murder weapon, the whole thing. What she was seeing was the murder of the donor. And wow. in fact, her descriptions of the murderer, and the murder weapon and everything else helped lead to the arrest and conviction of the killer of the donor. Isn't that why? Oh, wow. That is crazy. <laughs> Nine years old. Wow. And so, you know, um, so there are lots and lots of stories about this. Well, really, it's about the heart. And ancient peoples believe that the heart was the seed of the soul and the source of love and creativity and romance. And they really, they really idealized the heart. And, um, you know, in the modern world, we've never really given any credence to those ancient civilizations. In fact, pretty much every ancient civilization believed these things about the heart. Yes. Um, instead, those beliefs come down to us in our day, in the modern era, um, in the form of heart-shaped Valentine boxes of chocolates and things like that, right? Yes. It's, it's really about the heart. And so anyway, um, there are ancient uh, writings, scriptures. For example, in the Bible, the word heart is mentioned almost a thousand times. And um, there are scriptures that say things like, God doesn't look on the outward appearance of a person, he looks on the heart. Well, you know, it's all poetic license. But now what we're starting to find is that the ancients were right, that the heart really now is what we're believing to be uh, a second brain. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that they found that the heart is actually full of gray matter and white matter. There's a little heart or a little brain rather, they call it within the heart itself. They found that when one person is feeling love or affection for another person, that uh, that person's um, heartbeat will become measurable in the brain waves of that other person. And so there's this communication going on between us all the time. And the heart somehow contains the memories of the things we really love, right? Um, our, our true affinities, our true loves are in the heart. So when the heart gets transplanted, then all of a sudden, that's why people have these shifts. In fact, um, a neighbor of ours, big, tall, you know, very, a uh, masculine guy got a heart transplant from a woman. And as uh, soon as he gets out of the hospital and he's able to drive himself, he finds that his, his, he finds himself pulling into Starbucks, which he would never go to before. And he would find himself at the counter ordering a hazelnut latte. And he found out later that that was her favorite drink, right? <laughs> so, there are all these amazing uh, things that happen. Well, you know, back in the days when I was uh, in my practice working with people, finding emotional baggage and releasing it. Yes. There were times when I would come away just feeling like there was something missing, something was missing. And I didn't know what it was. But, um, but one day um, I had this experience uh, that was out of this world, really. Uh, and I'll, let me try to explain this. What happened was um, my wife woke me up early one morning. This was in 1998. Mm -hmm. And she said that um, she'd had a dream. And in the dream, there were these, there were three symbols. And when she woke up, she knew that these were three things uh, that had to do with her health and well-being. And so she asked me if I would help her decipher the dream. And so I did. And we figured out that the first two symbols from her dream were some inherited emotional energies we hadn't found before we cleared those out. And right. then when I turned my attention to the third symbol from her dream, mm -hmm. I suddenly had what I can only describe to you as a waking vision where suddenly the room that I was in was no longer there. And instead I'm seeing this 
unbelievably beautiful hardwood floor. It looked like I was looking down the hallway of this old hotel, you know, from the 18th century, but the, the floor was the most incredible uh, thing. It looked like it had a, a thousand coats of polish, maybe a million coats. I don't know. It was unbelievable looking. And it, this was very high definition. I mean, yeah. it's very hard to describe this. It was so bizarre. And I've never had anything like that happen to me before or since. But at the same time that I'm seeing this, and by the way, this lasted for several minutes, this vision. Yeah. As I'm seeing this floor, I have this understanding that comes into my mind that my wife's heart is underneath this floor. And I, I had no idea what this meant. And I told my wife what I was seeing and understanding. She had no idea what it meant. And so we said a prayer for some guidance. And then I started muscle testing her, trying to get some answers from her subconscious mind about what this was, what was going on. Well, my wife was born into a, a dysfunctional home. Her father was a rageaholic. And what we found was that uh, at around age two, she uh, had felt like her heart needed protection. And so her subconscious mind started to build a wall around her heart. And we found that that wall was made of layers of the emotional baggage that had been accumulated in her body. Yeah. And so, uh, so we call it a heart wall. And, I, and initially I thought, well, my wife has had some interesting things. She might be the only person in the world that has this. This is just really bizarre. Well, so what happened was now we know that about 93% of people have felt like their heart was going to break at some point. And so their subconscious mind put up a wall around their heart to protect their heart from being broken. And right. in, the, in the short term, it's like moving your heart into a bunker where it's safer. But the problem yes. is when the bombs stop falling, you know, when the bully moves away or your divorce is finalized and now you're moving on, now your heart is in a bunker. And so it makes it much more difficult for you to, uh, to give and receive love. It makes it much more difficult for you to, uh, to allow those creative ideas that are within your heart um, yeah. out into the world. And so um, anyway, with, with my wife, what had happened was she'd been through a number of experiences in her life that were difficult, uh, like many of us. And um, a lot of those difficult things had, had added layers. And so there were a number of layers to this. And it took us about two weeks of releasing these trapped emotions. And the price that she had paid for having this wall around her heart was that it was difficult for her to feel positive emotions. It was easy to feel negative emotions. She struggled right. with depression and with anxiety. And she always felt like, even with friends that she'd known all of her life, she always felt like she was kind of expendable, like she was the odd person in the group and like she never really belonged anywhere until that last emotion was removed. And then suddenly she felt like she belonged. And I mean, it was, it was a huge, huge shift for her. Um, when we were first married, I remember uh, we had a child. I didn't know that she was really shut down until our first baby was old enough that we could get a babysitter. My wife could not call a babysitter. She couldn't do it. She was so shut down. And that's when I first started realizing, but now, I mean, she gets up in front of hundreds of people and, and, talks at seminars that we do and so on. Yeah. Well, so, so this thing had been shown to us, this heart wall phenomenon. Yeah. What, one of the next people that I saw that had this going on was a woman that came to see me because she had really severe neck pain. And as I'm talking with her, she tells me that she's 38 years old. She's a nurse and uh, she is single and she hasn't dated in eight years. And in fact, um, she's never going to date again. She's going to die single. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And I said, what, why do you feel that way? What happened to you? She said that eight years before she was really deeply in love with this guy who dumped her and broke her heart and she hadn't dated since. And so I tested her using muscle testing and asking questions. 
And her yeah. subconscious mind said, yep, I've got a heart wall. There were three emotions, three layers uh, making up this wall of energy, this kind of a, like a force field around her heart. Each of right. those three emotions had to do with the breakup from eight years before. So I cleared those, it probably took me about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes to release those emotions. When the last emotion was cleared, all of a sudden, the neck pain was like a nine on a zero to 10 scale of pain. That's what brought her into my office it was gone, completely gone. And, wow. and so she leaves and she's feeling fine. And I, three months later, I didn't see her for three months. Three months later, she comes back into my office. And I'll always remember this. I saw her in my hallway and I said, hey, I said, I haven't seen you for a while. I remembered her really well because I had never met a celibate person really, except for the odd Catholic priest here and there, right? <laughs> right. And I said, how are you? What's going on? She said, you know, she said, my neck has been fine since I was here. But she said, you cleared that heart wall for me. And that really works. She said about two weeks after I was here, I found out my childhood sweetheart has been living right around the corner from me for almost wow. eight years. And she said, we're dating and we're in love. She said, I think he's going to ask me to marry him, right? Wow. And I thought, wow, what a huge shift, right? To go from being a celibate to almost engaged. But that's the, that's the power of this, you see. And what we now know is that 93% of people have this phenomenon going on. And so, you know, you look around the world and you see all the crazy things that people do to other people. Well, yeah. it's because there's a big wall around their heart. You see, yeah. we don't feel with this brain. This brain mm -hmm. feels nothing. This brain, yeah. by the way, um, Stacy, feels like it's perfectly acceptable and perfectly logical to drop bombs you know, and use war to settle differences between nations and so on and do all kinds of crazy things. But this brain, the heart brain, is where we feel. And that's why if someone is really hurting you, you feel it here. But by the same token, um, if you're if you're watching someone singing or playing or doing something that's to the the maximum of their ability, you also feel it here, right? Mm -hmm. And so um so we now know the majority of people have this wall. And uh, it's amazing what can happen when the wall is taken down because creative ideas start to flow for people and people fall in love who even sometimes in at very advanced ages, I mean, we've got lots of stories like that of people in their 80s and, and even older suddenly finding love because the wall is taken down. Uh, we have yeah. stories from people who who really didn't know what love felt like and right. until the wall was taken down. We've got people, many people have written this and have said that when the wall, the heart wall was taken down, that for the first time in their life, they can feel the love of the creator for yeah. them. I mean, it's uh, it's really an amazing thing. Uh, I want to tell you a couple more stories. Yeah, definitely, please. Um one of my favorite stories, and there are lots of these, if you go to our website at discoverhealing.com, um, you can read lots. I mean, we got thousands of these, but um, I one day, um, <clears throat> this woman brought her son in uh, to see us and my wife was working with me. And um, what had happened was her son was nine years old and it, started off that he he either would not do his homework or he wouldn't hand it in. And then she noticed that she'd come into his room sometimes at night and he'd be on the floor. And she'd say, what are you doing on the floor? And he would say, I don't deserve to be in a bed. And she just thought, what? That's really weird. And um, he he had this kind of a kind of a grimace, sort of a smile, but yeah. kind of like a fake smile, just pasted on right? All the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't know what to do with him. And it got, it was getting worse and worse. One day she paid a surprise visit to his school uh, only to find his teacher berating him for being pathetic because she couldn't get anything out of him. He wasn't responding. He was just so dysfunctional. So that was it. His mom took him out of school. She tried to do homeschool. That didn't work either. She took him to see a psychologist and a psychiatrist. She was told that he was severely depressed, clinically depressed. 
but that he couldn't be helped because he wouldn't admit that he was depressed. So she didn't know what to do. And right around that time, she heard about the heart wall and how it can help with depression. And so, so she brought him in and uh, my wife and I tested him and we found that he had a number of trapped emotions and um, we cleared these trapped emotions. And then we got to the very, the very core of it, the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and what had happened was uh, it happened when he was five years old, he was with his family. They were at a lake in California and uh, it was a family reunion. So there were other families there as well. And his best friend, this other little boy who was five years old, little cousin was there. And, um, and his sister was there and his sister was trying to teach this little cousin of theirs how to swim. So they were out on this dock at this lake. She was 12 years old and there was no adult supervision around. And this little boy that she was trying to teach to swim disappeared under the dock. Wow. Yeah. And so it was about, I don't know, 45 minutes later, the divers recovered his body and, uh, and this little boy was there and his sister was there and they pulled his body out. And of course he's blue and he's long dead. And uh, the absolutely crushing weight of guilt that his sister, his 12 year old sister was feeling for having such a horrific thing happen. And it was her yeah. fault. She was the babysitter. Um, that feeling, that energy, that guilt was so powerful that oh, yeah. it absorbed into his body. He absorbed that emotion and it immediately formed into a wall around his heart because his heart was going to break. He just lost his best friend and his poor sister. It was just beyond his ability to, to deal with. And so yeah. that was the beginning. And that was the last emotion that we cleared that day. It took us about a half an hour to, to clear all these other emotions and that they were making up this wall. And then that was the last one. And then the wall was gone according to his, you know, according to the muscle testing. And so his mom took him home. And for the next couple of days, he was just kind of lying around being lethargic. And she was thinking, well, it doesn't look like that worked either. What was happening is he was processing the release. And when you release trapped emotions, the body always go th goes through this kind of a processing. And sometimes you have symptoms from it and sometimes you don't. But anyway, um, on the morning of the third day after we worked on him, um, he got himself up early and got his backpack and uh, his books and everything and came downstairs and he said to his mom, this is a direct quote. He said, mom, I can go back to school now. I'm a happy pappy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so he did, he, he, he went back to school and, uh, and he was transformed and all of his yeah. learning disabilities were gone. And he went into the program for advanced kids because he was so smart. Um, but his mother told me, she said that, uh, if she had not been open to something so radically different from the norm yeah. that she said he would not have survived. And you look at how, how many kids don't survive. And he was only nine years old, but the depression was diagnosed as clinical. I mean, he was, he was severely depressed. So um, in fact, the worst cases of depression that I have seen in my life where people are literally having to decide you know, each day, if they're going to live one more day or end their life that day, I have seen those kinds of people turned around literally within days from having this heart wall removed. Wow. Um, children that are autistic, you know, one of the, uh, in my experience, every autistic child has a wall, has a heart wall. Mm -hmm. And many of these kids, a hallmark is that they won't make eye contact. But what we see and have many stories is that when that heart wall is taken down, it's one of the very first things they do is they make eye contact. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that is and wild. So, yeah. So anyway, um, you know, this, uh, the heart wall is just, it's such a powerful thing. Um, let me show you, uh, show you with you one more story. Yeah, definitely. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, back uh, when the emotion code book first came out, uh, I went back to an author's conference in Philadelphia 
And, uh, or maybe it was New York City. It might've been Manhattan. I can't remember now. One or the other, I guess it was Manhattan. And uh, it was this big room, all these authors. And then um, there are all these booths around the perimeter of this room um, with different uh, news outlets and so on. So there's Time Magazine here, Good Morning America, all the TV shows, all the magazines. And uh, so each of these new authors had about three minutes to pitch their book to Time Magazine, and then they go to Newsweek, you know what I mean? And then it's Good Morning America, and it was three minutes at every station. And so uh, there wasn't really very much interest in the emotion code, <laughs> but uh -huh. um, there, of course, now now there is, but, um, but back then there wasn't much interest. But anyway, I ended up um, being at a booth and talking with a woman who's a freelance uh, author, and uh, she was interested. So I was telling her about it, and at the end of our, our three minutes, the bell rang, and so we had a break for a while. And so I kept talking to her, and... Uh, she told me that she was an Orthodox Jew and she's 42 years old. She'd never been married. She had a goal to be married within that year. And I said, well, do you, do you have any prospects? And she said, no. And she said that she had never really even been in a long-term relationship. And um, so I said, you know, if you have a heart wall, it's going to be much more difficult for you to find your soulmate. Right. And she, she said, what is a heart wall? And I said, well, let me explain. So I explained it. And then I had a few minutes and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to help this woman because um, I don't have anything else to do and she needs the help. And so uh, so what I did is I sat across this table from her and, um, and I started asking questions and muscle testing her, getting answers on my own body and asking questions about, and that's one of the things we teach you how to do, and um, asking questions about this, uh, about her heart wall. And sure enough, she had a heart wall. And uh, there were, I think, five or six emotions making up this wall. In her case, she remembered each each emotion that we would find, and uh, I would figure out when it had happened, and and she would tell me what it was about, and you know, just difficult experiences in her life. So, uh, so she's sitting across from me. If you can imagine, I, I've handed her a magnet because you can use a magnet or your hand, uh, and uh, she's got a little magnet. And every time I find a trapped emotion and get it ready to be released, she swipes like this, one, two, three swipes to release the trapped emotion, right, with the magnet. We use the governing meridian, which goes right in that uh, track to release these. Oh. And anyway, um, we found the very last emotion and she, she swipes once and she swipes twice. She gets halfway through the second swipe to release this trapped emotion. And suddenly that emotion was gone and I knew it because I had this experience that I'll try to describe This is another one of those hard to describe things. Yeah. But all of a sudden it was as if it was like there was a, like, like a stone or something was suddenly rolled away from in front of her heart. And there was this, I mean, it was like light coming out of her heart. It was just, if you can imagine Imagine having a long, cold, gray winter and suddenly it's spring and, and you get the first sunny day and you walk outside and you just kind of feel the sun shining on you and it feels so great. That's what this felt like, but we're inside this building, but it was like the light that was coming out of her core. And and I'm in, I just happened to be in the beam of this. And uh, it's so hard to describe this. But anyway, I, I told her, I said, look, I said, now what's happening is I, I told her what I was feeling. And I, she was kind of looking at me like, I don't think she was really feeling anything. And right. uh, I, I, she, I think she thought I was maybe kind of from the moon. But um, <laughs> I said, look, now I said, that wall is gone. I said, now that pure essence of who you really are is able to radiate out into the world. And I said, now things are going to start being attracted into your life that you really want. And it's going to be much easier for you. And, um, and it, th this sounds like I'm totally making this up, but I swear this is true. This Orthodox Jewish medical doctor that I had met at this event, who on the scale of good looking, still to this day, I have yet to see a better looking man in all of my travels. This guy was like ridiculously good looking. He had the Roman nose and the big loose like black curls he looked like a like a greek statue come to life 
<laughs> I had met this guy at this event. He walks right by me like I'm not even there. And he walks right up to her like a moth to the flame and starts chatting her up, right? Wow. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, this this really works fast. And um, so it was, uh, I kept in touch with her for a while. She didn't get married, but she did end up having a book on the bestseller list that year. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so, uh, so anyway, I, I, and I've totally lost touch with her now, but I imagine she probably is married and probably has children and so on. But, you know, you think about, she'd never even been in a long-term relationship. She had this wall, right? And so yeah. what was, what would happen is I, the way that I try to describe this is, you know, when she'd see a good looking guy that she would be interested in, maybe she would send a little butterfly of love to that guy from her heart right? Because there's this communication that goes on between all of us all the time that we're totally unaware of. Yeah. And, and so that little butterfly of love, you know, leaves your heart, but it has to pass through all these layers of grief and sorrow and sadness and depression and resentment and anger. And so on. by the time it gets out on the other side of that, the little butterfly is not a butterfly anymore. It's, it's more like the thing from alien, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, the subconscious mind of the guy whose attention she's trying to get senses that and gets a message from his subconscious. Okay. That, that girl really has problems. You need to go away, leave. And so, um, so she, so she's alone. Right. And so this is what goes on. And now if you think about this, 93% of people have a wall put up. I believe this is the most important thing we can do for ourselves and mm -hmm. for our world is to start taking down these walls so that so that we can love each other instead of having all this resistance and all this resentment and all the negativity and all the conflict and contention in the world i mean this world is on a on a track really to transform the world the way i look at it the world is in labor it's trying to give birth to this new world and we see all of these old constructs that have held power over mankind for all of these centuries and they're desperate to hold on to their power and we can see that now it's like the scales are falling from our eyes and we've been blind but now we're starting to realize oh i see i see what's really going on in the world and you know people are waking up all over the, the consciousness level of the world is expanding a little bit more and a little bit more and more every single day and it's never going to go back to where it was no and um so the world is transforming but this heart wall is a piece of that you see, because, yes. you know, when you've got a heart wall, it's so much more difficult to really feel when the wall is taken down. Wow. Um, and there, there's so many stories about this. Our website is, is discoverhealing.com. And there's lots and lots of stories about people who have taken down their heart walls. It's something you can do yourself. You can hire somebody. We have practitioners all over the world. There's a map on Discover Healing, you can find somebody that can work on you if you want. But it's such an important thing. And uh, the great thing about it is it's all in here in the Emotion Code book. So you can actually read the book. You can learn how to do this method yourself and you can remove your own heart wall. Many people have done that. and uh, Or you can find someone else that can do it for you either way. But, um, but it's something that you really do need to look at. Uh, everybody, all your listeners, everybody needs to... Uh, to find out if they've got a wall that's been put up. And most people have, because, you know, we go through difficult things and we feel like yeah. our heart's going to break. I mean, most people, can you remember a time when you felt like that was going to happen to you? Like your heart was breaking? Oh, numerous times. Yeah. Right. So, yep. I think if you, if you have that feeling more than once, see when you're having that feeling, that physical sensation, like there's an elephant sitting on your chest or like you're choking, like you can't breathe. Your heart is really under a, under assault. And so yeah. the subconscious mind will try to help you put up a wall, yes. but, but then you pay this huge price for having that wall later. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Now, are there certain emotions that resonate in certain parts of the body or is it just where that energy formulates? It's just wherever it starts to formulate inside the body. Well, you know, the interesting thing about this is a great question. You'll notice that on the emotion code chart, on the column on the far left, we have mm -hmm. organs and glands that are listed. And okay. so, um, so what we believe uh, is what the ancients believed. And that is that uh, 
the organs and many of the glands in the body are actually frequency generators that generate these frequencies that we interpret as emotions. And so, mm -hmm. for example, um, if you look at the liver, the liver produces emotions like anger and bitterness and resentment and so on. Um, the lungs produce emotions like grief and crying and sadness. And um, the, uh, the heart produces these negative emotions like abandonment and betrayal and so on. Um, kidneys, um, fear, prime one there, terror. Um, and so, um, so what happens is when you, when you start to feel an emotion, <clears throat> there is a specific organ or gland that is, uh, or even maybe a pair of them that mm -hmm. are producing this frequency. And mm -hmm. so when that emotional energy, if it becomes lodged in the body, that emotional energy, that trapped emotion, that ball of energy can lodge anywhere, literally anywhere in the body. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you, you know, you might have a trapped emotion lodged in your thyroid. It might be contributing to thyroid trouble. You might have one lodged in your stomach area. It might be contributing to your ulcers or, or if it's lodged in your uterus, it might prevent you from conceiving and so on. So, um, but anyway, what we find also is that um, because the organs and the glands produce certain emotions, if an organ or a gland is out of balance or overloaded in some way, you'll mm -hmm. tend to feel those particular emotions more readily. A great example of this is the liver. A prime emotion from the liver is the emotion of anger. So right. what's the most common thing that people do to overload their liver? Well, they drink too much. How many people mm -hmm. are in jail right now because they drank too much and they were overstimulating the liver. The liver starts producing these emotions like anger and bitterness. Yes. And then they do something that now they're in jail for. It happens all the time. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Wow. This has been amazing. Uh, I, I'm speechless. Like, uh, the, you know, the information that you supplied today was just outstanding. And yeah, I always felt like the heart was really, it's, it's, it is the seed. I feel like the heart is more powerful than the brain. It basically, I feel like the, my, my perception was always that the heart gives the messages to the brain and then the brain yes. reacts. Yep. And yep. so, you know, I, I'm a believer in, even in the chakras and the seven chakras. And I like meditation because it clears the mind and, you know, just simple yoga poses just to al align the chakras. And I feel like that could be a contributing factor to helping not completely remove the wall, like you were saying, but I think maybe it might improve the way we're feeling and maybe lead us on that direction. Is that a possibility? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think so too. I mean, um, there are multiple ways I think that trapped emotions can be removed. The emotion code is uh, is just a really simple, um, very concrete way to ask questions and get answers and find out. Um, if you have a heart wall, you can find out. Um, the subconscious mind will tell you. And so, um, yeah, and that's that's really the message I wanted to share with with you and and all of your. Uh, all your listeners and viewers today is uh, is how important this this discovery really is. It's been called the most important discovery in the history of energy medicine, and yeah. it wasn't a discovery that I made. It was shown to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I never, in my wildest dreams, would have imagined something like this. I'm not that creative, yeah, um, but it is real. Um, who would have ever thought that that's that's reality? <laughs> when you when you spoke to your clients, you could you know, by working with them, you were able to kind of know how far back things were starting to resonate, where the problem was starting to, to, you know, begin. How did you come to that conclusion? Like what type of diagnosis led you to actually have an idea of when the problem was beginning? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> when you uh, think of it this way, okay. Mm -hmm. um, here's my phone, right? And right. Uh, my phone is essentially a computer. It has an right. interface. What's the interface? Yeah. Well, the interface is the screen and then I can touch things with my finger. Um, right. I'm sitting at my laptop. What's the interface? It's the screen and then the keyboard. Well, right. as a computer programmer, I realized that the subconscious mind has an interface, but it's not a keyboard and there's no screen. Um, instead, we can ask questions and then we can get answers provided that the answers 
uh, can come back in the form of a yes or a no. So essentially the subconscious mind is a binary computer. You can ask any question that you want and the subconscious will answer either with a, a strong muscle, for example, for yes, or a weak muscle for no. And you can test your own body. So one of the things that we have found is that when, when you're trying to identify a trapped emotion and release it, um, finding the trapped emotion is usually really fast. And the way that it works is you'll just ask questions like, um, like, for example, do you have a trapped emotion that we can release that's contributing to whatever problem this might be? And the subconscious mind might say yes. And if it's a yes, then we would ask, okay, is the emotion in column A? Maybe that's a no or a weak answer uh, on right. muscle testing. So that means it's in column B. So then we would ask, well, is it in an odd row in column B? See, the subconscious mind knows what emotion it is, and we have to play charades with the subconscious in a sense to figure it out. So is this yeah. emotion in column B? Yes. Is it in one of the odd rows? Maybe that's a no. So is it in row two? Maybe that's a no. Maybe it's in row four. So that narrows it down really quickly to, to five emotions. And then right. you just ask, well, is it uh, is it depression or frustration or indecisiveness or panic? Oh, it's panic. Okay. Um, the next question is, and we call this the million dollar question. It's really an important question to ask. And that is, do we need to know anything else about this? Or do we need to know more about this? See, the subconscious mind, really what it's trying to do is it's trying to close the loop on that emotional experience. And right. sometimes to be able to close the loop, it might need you to dig a little deeper. You might need to know, hey, this is from what happened, that big fiasco at graduation when you were 18. Remember that? Uh, yeah. It might want you to know that. Um, or it might want you to know, well, this was, uh, you know, this happened in the womb and you absorbed this from your mother because her relationship, you know, was not good. And so, um, so that's how the questions are asked really. And sometimes, yeah. uh, and sometimes we do need to dig a little bit deeper, but usually, usually not too much. Um, mm -hmm. so it's a very fast method. Most people, most people find that they can remove, find and remove a trapped emotion in less than a minute once they actually practice a little bit and get good at it. And anybody can learn it. We have kids yeah. that are doing it and having great success. Wow. And so, you know, what about people who have multiple walls up, you know, cause there could be traumatic events more than one that cause oh, yeah. them to build their wall even higher or thicker. Yeah. Most people will have, um, most people will have anywhere from four to 20 or so emotions making up that wall. Wow. And so uh, the celibate woman I told you about, she had three. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I see people that only have one. It just depends. Uh, it's all up to the subconscious mind. And so um, sometimes people will have a thicker heart wall and it will take longer um, we do, we sell uh, heart wall packages on our website at discover healing. And, um, and a lot of our practitioners do this as well, where, um, you can, you can buy like three sessions in advance and, uh, uh and then you'll have three possibilities. And if you need more than usually those might be included, like what we do at our office or at our practice, I don't have an office anywhere. I haven't practiced for many years, but, um, we have staff practitioners, um, mm -hmm. you can find on our website and then we've got people all over the world. We have a, um, we have a Google map, um, of, uh, people we've got, uh, we've certified almost 12,000, if not slightly over 12,000 practitioners now in, uh, in over 80 countries around the world. And some of them are listed on our, uh, on our, uh, practitioner map at discoverhealing.com. So that's another thing too. Um, if uh, people who start to do this, if they find that they really like this and it's and it's fun, they can actually start doing this for a living. We have a certification program that people can go through and learn how to really master this and do it really, really well. And and it's really yeah. uh, it's really inexpensive and it's kind of a go at your own you know your own pace kind of a thing. And yeah, but uh, yeah, it's been very successful all over. Wow, this is amazing. And and can people work with people? on zoom or do you have to yeah. be in person with the, you can do it on zoom okay no you can totally do it on zoom uh you can do it by email you can in fact um we were in uh istanbul last year and uh met one of our practitioners there who uh, uh he just does it all by email most of his clients are in the united states and uh he will pay him in advance he does their session remotely tunes into them does it remotely and we teach all of that actually in the book 
um, how to wow. work on someone that's on the other side of the planet or the other side of the country. You can totally do that. It's a very concrete kind of a thing. And the first time that you try that and you're working on a friend and you know suddenly their pain is gone or suddenly something is corrected, in that moment, your life will change because you'll realize, wow, um, this actually works. And as human beings, we are just, just beginning yeah. to scratch the surface on what we actually are capable of. And it's, it's mind blowing. So most of our practitioners, you know, like I said, almost 12,000 people are slightly over that they're, um, they're working with other people in other countries all over the world and they're doing it as a routine thing every day. And it's quant the understandings really of quantum physics have made this not only possible, but also understandable. We now know how it actually works. And we've right. been living in this Newtonian physics world um, ever since Newton, but now we're realizing, okay, it's time for Einstein. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very true. This is amazing. So your website not only has your book, but it also has a directory of services where they can visit different practitioners. They yeah. could also do it on Zoom where they don't have to be in the office. They could actually have practices with somebody. Yeah. And they your book also supplies um how to do it at home if you're if you're yeah. able to. That's sure. you really can learn cool. how to do it yourself. And uh and that's really, uh, I mean, it's great to have other people work with you. And sometimes what a lot of people do is, is they'll start that way and then realize, you know what, I, this doesn't really look that hard. I think I can do this. And yeah. then they start doing it. And then they start, you know, healing their own family and their loved ones. And by extension, you know, their ancestors, because they're finding inherited things. And this mm -hmm. also works on, on animals, by the way, it's, uh, it, it's really the most powerful healing method that we have ever seen for animals. I mean, animals all have emotional baggage and just like human beings, animals will manifest problems um, physically or behaviorally that are emotionally rooted. And so, uh, so we teach you how to do that as well. There's a whole chapter on animals in the book. It's, oh, that's, that's very one of the most cool. fun things. Yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, animals are just like humans. They, you know, the only yeah. thing is, is, is the verbal communication, but they, they do. Yeah. If you ever, if you ever have an, uh, like a dog, for instance, they will, my dogs talk to me in high, low frequencies. You know, it's like, they're trying to have a conversation. They want me to understand. And yeah. they'll be in sound wise, they'll be going high, low, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. Oh, we've seen some, there's some incredible stories in the book about, um, some of the animal experiences that we have had. And uh, yeah, it's one of the great, one of the, one of my favorite things actually is working with animals. And, and I love the fact that you have a certification that people can actually become certified and practice it and teach it yeah. also. So that's amazing. I like that a lot. Tell people one more time where they can find your website so they can go to it. Yeah. Uh, the website is discover healing, H E A L I N G dot com. It's really easy. Discover healing. And uh, we've got lots of great resources there, videos, uh, lots and lots of uh, things you can look at and you can get the book there. You can look into certification. You can find a practitioner there. Uh, yeah. That's Discover excellent. healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Nielsen, this has been a, such a pleasure. I, I just love talking with you and you, the stories were amazing. The knowledge you shared with our, our audience is fabulous. I, I thank you very much for coming on the show. This has been a, a really wonderful, you know, uh, time talking to you and, and the information you had to share was just outstanding. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Stacey. And uh, boy, I have to compliment you on uh, on all the great work that you're doing in the world. You're, you're really on a roll. Uh, I think you're amazing. So thank you for your thank great you. work. And thanks for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you very much for that beautiful comment. Well, you have a great day. You too. Thanks.